Notice the instructions, which I did not include the um, exam sheet for you, but it's still on D2L. Choose one and only one. All of you did that. Write a well-written essay, um, free from grammatical, spelling, mechanical errors that argues a strongly worded thesis. All bold. You must include a works cited page. Now, I went a little easy this time. I won't next time. If you didn't have a works cited page, this time you got a D. Next time it's an F. Okay, so warning. Um, use parenthetical citation, please. Citing by axing lines. Uh, you must indicate what topic. Most of you did that. When does it do? All that kind of stuff. So, topics. Two of the number one, choose two of the plays, write about the theme of character. Nobody did that one. I'm kind of surprised. Number two, how does Shakespeare use the settings of his plays not only to influence and affect the characters, but to direct our or, or to direct or influence our understanding of the meaning of the plays? If you didn't do both parts, you didn't get full credit. In other words, the question is two pronged. One, how does it how does it influence and and direct or affect the characters within the play? But then, how does it also influence and direct our understanding of the play? Okay. Um, three. Nobody did. Um, number four, the trope of mistaken identities and or disguise, and why he uses them. Again. Too prompt. It's not enough to just do one of the two. You have to address both parts of that. How he uses them and why he uses them. Also, um, this one and the last one were the two um, favorite topics. Mistaken identity is not the same as a disguise. Or a disguise is not the same as a mistaken identity. Okay? Um, when Count Orsino talks to Viola as Cesario, Viola as Cesario is not a mistaken identity. That's a disguise. We do see a mistaken identity in that play, though. Where is it? Okay, that works. Because Sebastian's not pretending to be anybody else. He's, he's himself. He just looks an awful lot like Viola slash Cesario. Where else? What does Malvolio pick up? The letter. Who does he think wrote the letter? Olivia. That's a case of mistaken identity. Not where he looks at Olivia and goes, hmm. No, it's he makes an assumption. Why? Because the letter forms of the individual letters are all appropriate such, okay? Lastly, what do the comedies say about the relationship of reason and romantic love? Notice, their relationship together. You can't talk about reason within the plays and romantic love. It's how the two are connected in some way, okay? Um, I, overall, I was fairly pleased with these. There were a couple of A's. One or two Bs, I don't remember how, exactly how many. Primarily, uh, or mostly the rest were Cs, and then there were two or three Ds. And I think the two or three Ds were primarily because of boneheaded mistakes, like forgetting a works cited page. Um, or not proofreading well enough. I mean, you know, one of them had multiple spelling errors, like... 10 or 15 spelling errors on each page, okay? So, all of this pretty, should be pretty clear. You're all, almost all of you are English majors. Word, word choice isn't something that's kind of going to, um, isn't something that's going to change an A grade to a B, okay? Word choice just means you've chosen a word, yeah, yeah, it works in the context, but you know what? In the 1.5 million words in the English vocabulary, there's some better ones that you can choose. WW, however, means wrong. It doesn't fit. It's, it's the wrong choice of words in that context. Agreement, agreement, error. Okay. 
Here is the number one agreement error students make. And here's why it's an agreement error. I'll explain what it is in just a moment. The reason... i got to be careful. No, I don't. What the hell is it? Um, you're riding along and you say... <clears throat> one should think love and reason are not connected. So... One, dot, 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 because he. That's an agreement error. Why? Well, this is specific. This is not. Okay? That's one kind of agreement error. If you're going to use one and you want to be non-sexist, that's what I would suggest to do. Just use it all throughout. Okay? Because the other way that the writing center, for example, will tell you the way how to get rid of sexist language. They will say to use they when you mean what? Kim's back there shaking his head. When you mean what? One person. That's an agreement error. And there are only a few of us in this department who will still get you for this. Because writing centers say, use they. It's nice, it's generic, it's also plural. So if you're going to use they, everything else has got to be appropriate. Because if you really mean one, then you can't say they is. So don't use they, because I will... Hit that every time. Because usually what students do is they'll use this sometimes. And other times, within the same body, within the same paragraph, they'll use he, she, one, you. Okay? So that's, that's become a big problem in writing. You look in any newspaper, they'll use that for the singular non-gender specific. Okay. Why? We speak that way, right? I talked to somebody the other day and they said, but what's the difference between speech and writing? Writing isn't just speech on a page. It's different than that. Because when you're speaking, many people, don't do what while they're speaking. They don't think it all through. They just, blah, 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 blah. you know, they have what's called logorrhea. It's diarrhea of the mouth. It just <laughs> comes out, okay? You got to think before you speak, all right? So you'll hear real adept thinkers will use this as they speak rather than this. Why? Because they're being very careful with their choice of terms. Very careful with how um, one communicates. Okay? So, subject verb agreement? Yes. Oh, so there's never a singular usage for they? I would say no. Okay. So what would, what would be... And historically there isn't. I, I, mean, I teach history of the English language. I look at language from, from the long view, from the historical view. I look at words, and I look at their etymologies as to what they mean today. Now, words shift in meaning over time, sure. Okay. But lots of times, even when they shift meaning, you can go back to the root of the word and go back to its earliest meaning and say, okay, now how did it shift to become this? Okay, go on with your question. Uh -huh. So it would be a good, if you're using one, one believes it can find this and this and this, because... One thing. Another, use one again. Yep. And so you use one, oneself, not one's self. Okay. Or, you can be really bold and choose a gender to write the paper from the perspective of. Now, 
In some circles, you can't do that. Why? Because it's sexist, supposedly. I would be one, if you wanted to argue with, with me, let's have at it, that would say, no, it's not sexist. It's only sexist if you're making an assertion that all actors are male. But it's not sexist to use the term actor when you're referring to male people who go up and do the roles of plays or go up and are in films. Why? Because the O-R ending on the word indicates a male person who does this. The R-E-S-S -S ending indicates it is a female person who does this. So to say Jennifer Lawrence is an actress is not sexist. To say Jennifer Lawrence is an actor is grammatically incorrect. You're confusing your gender there. Right? Historically. Now, unless we just want to take all of these little endings that we have on words still today and throw them out the window, in which case we're going to have some other problems. Okay? Um, comma splices, what's a comma splice? Two complete thoughts, two independent clauses separated by a comma. Bottom went in the wood, comma, he was transformed into an ass, period. Each of those is an independent thought, an independent idea. Bottom went into the wood, comma, and he was transformed into an ass. Bottom went into the wood, semicolon, he was transformed into an ass. Right. Sentence fragment's pretty clear. You're missing something to make the thing into a real sentence. Usually where that happens is a student writes something, writes a sentence, um, bottom became an X. Meaning, he had an ass's head put on him. Okay? By beginning the sentence with this, what does that make the rest of the sentence? It's a participial phrase. Participial phrases modify something. Okay? So, bottom became an ass, comma, meaning, and then you go on. Why? Because this phrase then modifies this whole clause. Right? Um, few sentences, what used to be called run on sentences, I have no idea who came up with the phrase or idea. Fused sentences, apostrophe error. Are you using the apostrophe to indicate plurality? Because you don't. <laughs> okay. Apostrophes are for possession and or contractions. Even though historically, apostrophes aren't for possession. How do you know? We have one word in the English language today where you don't use the apostrophe for possession. It's. It's. Okay. That apostrophe for, for possession, like the boy's dog. You know what the apostrophe S actually is there? Historically, what it goes back to, the boy, his dog. You're eliding these two. When you elide them, you take out that vowel. You're not pronouncing it anymore. You can see this in Shakespeare. Shakespeare writes, Mars, his sword. Right? But that's not how it's pronounced on the stage. On the stage, it's pronounced Mars's sword. That's where it comes in. In Old English and in Early Middle English, the genitive possessive was written with just ES on the end, okay, to indicate possession. Um, insert. So there's either something down here, like a comma or a period or a semicolon, 
And sometimes it may be this way, where you're inserting an apostrophe. Insert what's ever below or above that carrot. Okay? Align through something kind of with a circle means get rid of it, delete it. Hold on, Amelia. Huh? Um, this one's pretty clear. <laughs> huh? Question mark, question mark. I mean, you, you lost me. I uh, don't have a clue what you're talking about. And I usually say, you lost me. No idea what you mean. Okay? Um, indent, you're writing about verse or plays. I don't know how many of you have had the 3,000, how many of you have had the 3,000 course? Intro to Literary Studies or whatever it's called. Only one of you, okay? Maybe two of you. Hopefully you go over this. We used to go over this in our sophomore, <coughs> in our second semester writing course. But now the English department no longer teaches writing about literature in that course. We teach how to get in touch with your inner self or something. So, when you're writing about verse or drama, more than three lines. More than three lines of verse or more than three lines of drama, you indent and do a block quote. That is, you quote it exactly as it appears on the page in your book. Okay? If it's less than three lines, you quote, dot, dot, dot. At the end of where the line is, you have a space, that's, that sign equals at a space, slash, space, quote, space, slash, space, quote, in the quotation. Okay. It's only when it's three lines or less that you work that into your paragraph. If it's more than three lines, you block into two tab stops or one inch, either of the two, from the left hand margin. You don't indent at all from the right hand margin. Unless MLA 8th edition changes all of this, and I just bought it the other night, put it on my Kindle, but I haven't read it yet because I hate what they've done with some stuff. Idiots. Um, and so then for the in text citation, you put that. Do you put that in that block, or do you put it below? No, you put it. You put it at the end. So you're writing along like this. You introduce your quotation. Your quotation begins here. So it goes like that. You use the terminal punctuation if there is terminal punctuation within your quotation. That, like if it ends with a period, you put the period there. Then you have your citation. Okay. If the quotation is speech, usually is a drama, <laughs> you use quotation marks. Okay? If it's not speech, if you're quoting from a novel and it's just narration, you don't use quotation marks there. Why? Because the fact that you set it off is the indicator it's quoted. Okay? Um, this then needs to be at scene line number. If you've not introduced the play that you're writing about, use a abbreviated form, A, M, N, D, underlined or italicized, 2, 1, 32 to 36. 32, 33, 34, 35, 36. That's five lines. Okay, so it's going to be block quoted and such. Um, case, grammatical case. Difference between who, for example, and whom. Nominative case, subject of the sentence, whom. It's receiving the action of the verb. Very few times, but there was one or two papers that had something like that, so I threw it in there. Transpose, reverse the order. This is usually when I use this or put this on a student's paper, I'm, I'm editing for style. I'm, I'm making what you've written a little less clunky and flow a little bit more fluently. Okay. Um, line divisions, show line divisions. 
That's these. Because a lot of you quoted, you know, multiple lines, but they just ran all along, ran all across. Okay? Sometimes you actually kind of showed me where those line divisions broke because the first word here, even though you didn't have this, would have a capital letter. Why? The convention of printing is in a play, um, usually, or in a work of verse, every line of verse is capitalized. All right. Now, it's not all that way all the time. Mean, Falstaff does not speak in verse, but some of the other characters do. Okay. Um, put this in brackets. This is going to usually be when you use an ellipsis. Why do you put it in brackets? You're telling me or your reader, I've dropped something. This is my modification to the exact quote. If you don't put it in brackets, that means dot, dot, dot is in the original. All right? Spelling. Just something circled means you figure it out. There's a, there's a problem here. Usually it's a spelling error. Okay. Now, I just posted. Oh, I got this too. Sure. I just posted this morning to, um, to your email, D2L email. A thing I came across the other day by a... Um, I think I've referred to him before, and, and some of you um, may take offense at my posting this, but too bad. Um, it's a kind of a guide to writing. It's not kind of. It is a guide to writing. It's a guide to writing um, by Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson's a Canadian psychologist. He's real big today on YouTube and all this other stuff because of some positions he's taken. Anyways, it's a guide to writing he gives to his, like, upper division psychology students. Okay? It's long. It's really long. But it is essentially how to write an essay. And it begins with why you write an essay. And he says, you know, sometimes you write an essay. Why? Because you have a professor who requires you to write an essay. But he says it's much, much more than that. And I'm not going to spend much time on this. You write an essay to do what? To force yourself to think clearly. Because what does an essay do? It expresses ideas. Right? And when you write that essay, what you write should not be what you would just naturally say. Because as I said before, we don't always think through everything we say. The essay is the opportunity to force yourself to think about whatever that topic is. So, for example, use one nobody wrote about. Um, discuss the theme of illusion in the plays. Now, he gives you this whole process. And you might look at it and go, this guy's absolutely out of his mind. This would take forever. Because he suggests coming up with an outline. That outline has 10 sentences. For each of those 10 sentences or ideas, you then come up with 10 to 15 sentences to explain that idea. Well, you do that, guess what? You've written your rough draft right there. That's it. All you have to pretty much do at that point is start playing around with it. Moving phrases, moving paragraphs maybe, deleting stuff, maybe doing some word choice, you know, kinds of things. Um, but, you know, I've been teaching this stuff for 20 six, 27, 28, whatever, years now. And I've read, you know, Strunk and White's Elements of Style, Zinser's Writing Well, etc. I've read a ton of books on and things on how to write well. This thing hit me like a sledgehammer between the eyes the other day. Because, one, it is so clear and it is so practical. Long? Yeah. Would it take time to do everything? Yeah, it would. But you know what else, what else would come at the end of that? You would know exactly what you think about whatever the topic is you're writing about. And more importantly, so would I. 
or any other professor you have. They would, I would, never say, huh? I would never be unclear as to what your meaning was. Okay? All right. Enough of that. Um, Henry the Fourth, Part Two. Now, I don't know if I mentioned this before, um, but when I was a doctoral student, I was also a research assistant for a couple of years, and then went on to later on work for the project um, that I was a research assistant on. And the guy who was my boss and then director of my dissertation, he was, you know, I don't know, 30 years older than me and such. But, you know, he went through graduate school and came out of graduate school in the late 60s, early 70s. Okay. And every now and then we'd just be, you know, shooting the breeze in his office. And I remember us talking to him, I think, about one of the Henry IV plays. And he started going on about how in his day, you know, I've used Obama and Bush and Trump to some extent in classes. Well, he said, in his day, it was all about Nixon. Henry IV was Nixon. Not all that commonly seen, and yet people loved him. Nixon supposedly was, according to some people, the person best suited for the job. That is, this is a person who was kind of born to be president. You know, he'd been vice president for eight years under Eisenhower. He barely lost the 1960 election. And pretty much everybody today says the only reason Nixon lost the 1960 election was because of voting shenanigans, primarily in Chicago. If he carried Illinois, he would have won. And suddenly a bunch of people voted who were more than likely six feet under the ground. Okay? But there's a lot of parallels. All I'm getting at there is if any of you go on to be, you know, uh, go on to graduate school and you're teaching and you teach this play, you're probably going to tell your students at some point, you know, when I had this in college, it was, why? What does that tell us? What up? Timing? What else? Timeless, yes. It's timeless. That's telling us about Shakespeare's, as Ben Johnson says, he was not of an age but for all time. He's writing about ageless themes and ideas here. Because you can remove Bolingbrook and you can supply a lot of politicians into the king. Okay. He's writing about types, if you want, archetypes. So, look at the second part of Henry the King, uh, of King Henry IV begins. Enter rumor, painted full of tongues. Shakespeare very seldom does something like this. Because what is rumor? It's not a person, right? It's, it's, it's an airy nothing. <laughs> Here, given a local habitation and a name, to paraphrase Theseus. And so a rumor comes in and essentially gives us the prologue. Henry V, we're going to get a prologue. Okay? It's almost like Shakespeare's saying, all right, folks, get ready. Fasten your seatbelts. We're in for a ride. Wait till you get to the prologue for the next play. Open your ears, for which of you will stop the vent of hearing when loud rumor speaks. Come on. You think you're better than this, but what? What, what, what's that? What, what? Trump did what? Obama said what? I, from the Orient to the drooping West. What's the Orient? Asia. It's the East. Yeah, we think of it as Asia. But it's the East. That's all Orient means. So when you Orient something, literally, this is, you know, etymology, literally, what are you doing? 
you're facing it in a direction tied to the east as the standard. Okay? Now, we think about that for a moment. Why? Why is the east the standard? This is, this is a question that goes back thousands of years. This is a question that is tied to who most of the peoples of Western Europe, okay, Russia, India, Iran, all come from. Back around 5000 BC. A little group of people called the Indo-Europeans. Okay? This idea of orienting, of facing east, comes from them. It's east and, to them also, a little bit south. Okay? We can talk about that later. So, he says, I come from, you know, talking about from the east to the drooping west. In other words, horizon to horizon. That encompasses what? The whole world. Because we don't see the horizon to horizon on the other side of the world, right? We only see it on our side. Making the wind, my post horse still unfold, the axe commence it on this ball of earth. Upon my tongue's continual slanders ride, the which in every language I pronounce. What? Stuffing the ears of men with false reports. Timelessness, right? False reports. What's the phrase for false reports today? Fake news. That's exactly what rumor is talking about. Something that is reported as what? Truth. And yet it's not. Like the... Um, oh, shit, should not go there. But what the hell. Like the 17-year-old um, kid from Parkland, Florida, who's become a media darling because of his anti-gun stance. Who was on, I don't know, something on CNN the other day, which I saw a thing this morning. It's now the Children's News Network. Um, was on CNN the other day and making statements such as, the governor of Florida is the boss of the sheriff of Broward County. True or false? Definitely false. Why? Because the sheriff of Broward County's boss is whom? The mayor. Nope. Mayor can't replace him. Mayor can't fire him. The people, why? He's elected. He's elected. Okay. Now, there is something apparently in the Florida Constitution where the Florida governor could remove because of malfeasance, dereliction of duty, that kind of, but he's not the boss. The kid also made the statement. Dana Lash, who's the NRA spokesman, is the Person in charge of the NRA. No. Okay. And several other things. False reports. Okay. And yet, the, the CNN um, journalist talking, interviewing, did not make any corrections to any of this student's statements. Why? Because they're not journalists. Okay, because they're, did you say not a journalist? Or? No, they're, I mean. Okay. It sounds better. Sounds better? Why else? <laughs> well, he's just been through a shooting. You can't you know, disagree with him on national news. But what if what he's saying on national news is false? I mean, he's putting himself out there, right? It's not like somebody's forcing him to do that. So... I speak of peace. Notice, stuffing the ears of men with false reports. I speak of peace while covert enmity under the smile of safety wounds the world. Rumor says what? There's peace in the world. Where's the world? England. While beneath the veneer of peace, there's what? Enmity. Covert enmity. So, go down to line 20. But what need I thus, my well-known body, to an, an, I hate that word, 
anatomize, 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 not anatomize, man. It's like one of my daughters who once pronounced tenacity, Tennessee. And so the rest of my family just never, never will let, I mean, she'll be 50 years old and they'll be going, you know. So what need I thus, my well-known body, to anatomize among my household? To anatomize, to break down into its elements among where? My people. In other words, you guys all know this. You're aware of this. Why is rumor here? I run before King Harry's victory. Now, the Harry there is Henry IV. Hen Harry's just a nickname for Henry, okay? Who, in a bloody field by Shrewsbury, that's how it's pronounced, it's not Shrewsbury, it's Shrewsbury. In a bloody Vic field by Shrewsbury, hath beaten down young Hotspur and his troops, quenching the flame of bold rebellion, even with the rebels' blood. So, I go before Henry, and rumor tells us what actually happened. But what I mean to speak so true at first. So, in, that, in those three or four lines from 23 to 27, rumor has just done what? Not issued a false report. So why am, I, why am I telling you the truth? Well, 28. My office is to noise abroad that Harry Monmouth fell under the wrath of noble Hotspur's sword and that the king before the Douglas's rage stooped his anointed head as low as death. What is rumor going to say? The rebellion was successful. Prince Hal... Prince of Wales is dead by Hotspur's hand, and the king is dead by the Douglas's hand. Notice, that is what to the truth? It's the exact opposite. Okay. I was listening to the radio the other day, and a guy was talking about quote-unquote mass shootings, and he said, you know, what invariably happens every time is... We see the news, we see video of cops rushing to the scene, of people being walked, walked out, hands up, or carried out on stretchers and such. And what, what meanwhile is going on while we're seeing those images? We're seeing one thing, we're hearing something else. What are we hearing usually? Analysis. What kind of analysis? Analysis based upon what? Speculation. That's exactly it. And this commentator said, what usually proves true. Almost everything we learned within the first 24 hours was wrong. I mean, the Parkland shooting. What was one of the first things we heard? This kid had been expelled from that school. No. He had it. He had numerous interactions with school authorities, with the police. When I say numerous, we're talking dozens. Was never expelled. Not once. I mean, including punching teachers, coming to school with a backpack with bullets in it. I mean, threatening people, hitting people. Never expelled. Right? That's an example of the truth was the exact opposite. So, this have I rumored through the peasant towns. So, rumor is running before Henry and Hal <coughs> making their way back. Between that royal field of Shrewsbury and this worm-eaten hold of ragged stone, where a hot spurs father, take my course in London, this summer, and you will go to that worm-eaten hold of ragged stone. He's talking about Annick Castle. Rumor is. Annick Castle is the second largest continuously inhabited castle in England. The largest continuously inhabited castle is Windsor. Annick Castle has been there since the 13th century. 
and has been lived in. And the Percys still live there. The Percy family, the Dukes of Northumberland, still live there. Coolest thing, you walk in, you go, you take the tour, you know, you go into the living quarters and you go into the Duke's library, which if you're like me, you know, you just have to wipe the slobber off your face because it's just magnificent. And, you know, there's a, first time I went, they didn't have this, but now they do, big screen TV with beanbag chairs in front of it, okay? And on the Duke's library table, all the pictures of the family. Well, when I first went there with my family, in 2003, the Duke had a son who was just like two or three years older than my eldest daughter. And we're like, Katie, yeah, we, we, we can work this out some way, you know. Leave MTSU, transfer to, uh, I think it is, um, University of Minnesota at St. Cloud. And then do their junior year abroad where you live at Anna Castle. And go to school there. Well, what is the, what is the Percy family doing? Are they just always having... It's, believe me, it's big. Okay. <laughs> never know you're there. I mean, the castle itself and its grounds are from like, I don't know, front side of Cope to KOM. The walls around encompass that much area. It's huge, okay? You only go in through, and the, the kids who go to school there, I mean, they live in part, but then, then they also work at the castle for part of their time there. But, man, lifetime experience. So, he says, where Hotspur's father, old Northumberland, lies crafty sick. Crafty sick. Feigning sickness. So, when Hotspur was told, your father's lying sick. Getting ill. Nope. Why didn't Northumberland show up at Shrewsbury? Uh, cowardice? Did he realize? Not a good idea. Okay. So Bardolph comes in. This is not the same Bardolph who hangs out with Hal and Falstaff at the tavern. This is Lord Bardolph. Okay. He comes in and he's talking to Northumberland. So we're now, we're at Annick. We're at Northumberland's castle. And Bardolph says, line 14, the king is almost wounded to the death. <clears throat> and in the fortune of my lord, your son, Prince Harry, slain outright. So Bardolph has heard the rumors and he's now passing them on. And both the blunts killed by the hand of Douglas. Young Prince John and Westmoreland and Stafford fled the field. And Harry Monmouth Braun, the Hulk Sir John, is prisoner to your son. Notice, everything there is false but one. Blunt did die by the hand of Douglas. Why did Douglas kill Blunt? Blunt was disguised as the king. When it says Lord John, Falstaff or Lancaster? Um, which, which your Lord John? Line 19, Sir John, that's Falstaff. Okay. okay. The okay. earlier young Prince John, that's John of Lancaster. Okay. Okay. Between the Johns and the Harrys, it's yeah. kind of hard to keep up. Yeah, which when you know when you talk with Falstaff and you use the word John, that could be the colloquial you know term of a person who uses the prostitute, you know, so because it fits. And Shakespeare would, I mean, Samuel Johnson said Shakespeare never met a pun he didn't like, you know. So Bardolph brings this word to Northumberland. What's his kind of immediate reaction? Yeah, I, I was just derived. In other words. What's your proof? Did you get that from CNN or did it come from, you know, somebody else? Saw you the field. What's he asking for? Did you see it at my road eyes? Yeah, I don't think we're not doing it, fellow. Othello asks of Iago proof that his wife Desdemona is faithless to him. He says, give me the ocular proof. 
I've got to see it with my own eyes. Okay? Did you see this with your own eyes? In other words, did you see Harry Monmouth on the ground flip his body over with your foot and see the dead look in his eyes? Came you from Shrewsbury? I, I spake with one that came from there. A gentleman, well-bred and of good name, that freely rendered me these news for true. Well, who was that gentleman? Rumor. Okay, so Travers comes in. And Bardolph says, I rode past Travers on my way in. Okay? So Bardolph gets there first. He brings Northumberland one set of news. And Bardolph says, he is furnished with no certainties more than he happily may retail from me. He doesn't have anything more to say than what I've just told you. Okay? So Travers comes in and says, um, Sir John Umfreville turned me back with joyful tidings, being better horsed, outrode me. After him came spurring hearted gentleman, who almost forspinked with speed. That stopped by me to breathe his bloody horse. He asked the way to Chester. Of him, I did demand what news from Shrewsbury. Okay. Chester, if we had a map of England, you know, comes big bump, East Anglia. Come over here, Cornwall. Come over here, Wales. Not here. Chester's up here. Shrewsbury is in the what, what's called the Western Marches, real close to the border with Wales. Right? Northwest England. So Shrewsbury's like this. Northumberland's up here. Annick is like up here, right? London's down here. So, I did demand what news from Shrewsbury, line 40. He told me rebellion had bad luck, and the young Harry Percy Spur was cold. Again, notice the pun. He's no longer hot spur. Nope, he's dead. With that, he gave his able horse the head. That is, took off like a rocket. Northumberland. Ha! <clears throat> Again. Said the young, said he, young Harry Percy Spur was cold. Of hot spur, cold spur? That rebellion had met ill luck? In other words, two opposing reports. So now he doesn't know which one's true. Bardolph. If my young lord, your son, have not the day, upon mine honor, a silken for a silken point, I'll give my barony. Don't believe it. I'll give my barony means you can have all my lands if Hotspur's really dead. Why should the gentleman who rode by Travers then say such tidings of loss? Who he, that is, who was he? What was his name? Because I'm Lord Bardolph. Bardolph is implied. He was some hilding fellow that had stolen the horse he rode on and upon my life spoke at a venture. That is, he just made it up. Look, here comes more news. Okay, in comes more news. Yea, this man's brow, like to a tidal leaf, foretells the nature of a tragic volume. Like to a tidal leaf, that is, the tidal page of a book about tragedy is going to have what imagery on it? Sadness. There will be sad faces on that tidal page. He can read the news Morton is about to deliver just by the look on his face. So looks the strand where on the imperious flood, look outside, <laughs> hath left a witness usurpation. Come from Shrewsbury? Shrewsbury? I ran from Shrewsbury, my noble lord, where hateful death put on its ugliest mask to fright our party. How doth my son and brother? Thou tremblest. And the whiteness in thy cheek is apter than thy tongue to tell thy errand. Morton isn't just silent for a moment. He trembles. Whether that means he's physically trembling or his lips are trembling, he 
because he's afraid to tell his Lord, your brother and your son are dead. Line 79, Northumberland continues and finishes his speech. Well, let's back up. 74, but Priam, king of Troy, found the fire ere he his tongue, and I, my Percy's death, ere thou reportst it. This thou wouldst say, your son did thus and thus, your brother thus, so fought the noble Douglas, stopping my greedy ear with their bold deeds. Stopping, plugging it up with what? Your son died how? Honorably. Honorably. Full of glory, as did your brother and as did the Douglas. But notice they're all what? <laughs> Dead. But in the end, to stop my ear indeed, thou hast a sigh to blow away this praise, ending with brother, son, and all are dead. He's kind of, kind of, getting at what Falstaff was getting at when he was talking about honor. What does honor get you? A plot in the ground. Douglas is living. Yay! <laughs> Here's some good news. And your brother, yay. But for my Lord, your son, why he is dead. Remember, was Northumberland actually ill? Nope. See what a ready tongue suspicion hath. Suspicion. That is, Northumberland is telling us, this is what I thought was he suspected this kind of thing, which is why he stayed home. He that but fears the thing he would not know hath by instinct knowledge from others' eyes that what he feared is chanced. Speak, Morton. Morton says, your spirit is too true. Like, you have a prophet in you. <laughs> Your fears too certain. Yet for all this, say not that Percy's dead. I see a strange confession in thy eye. Thou shakes thy head and holdst it fear or sin to speak the truth. If he be slain, say so. You haven't said it yet. Bartoff, I can't believe it. Your son did? Morton. I'm sorry I should force you to believe that which I would to God I had not seen. But these mine eyes saw him in bloody state, rendering faint quittance, wearied and outbreathed, outbreathed, to Harry Monmouth. That is, he was out of breath in fighting Harry Monmouth, whose swift wrath beat down the never daunted Percy to the earth. And if you've watched the Hollow Crown version, if I remember correctly, Harry Monmouth, Prince Hal, kills Falstaff from the ground. That is, Monmouth has been knocked to the ground. And Percy's coming up and getting ready to run him through. And Harry essentially does this with his sword from the ground. In other words, not what Morton reports. Morton reports that it was Harry Monmouth who essentially beat down Hotspur. The never daunted, whose swift wrath beat down the never daunted Percy to the earth. Line 112. In few, that is, in few words, his death, whose spirit lent a fire even to the dullest peasant in his camp, being brooded once, took fire and heat away from the best tempered courage in his troops. Once the rebels saw Hotspur dead, what happened? They lost their nerve. For from his metal was his party steeled, which once in him abated, all the rest turned on themselves like dull and heavy lead. They turned, essentially, and ran. 125. Then was that noble Worcester soon, too soon, tamed prisoner, and that furious Scott, the bloody Douglas, 
whose well-laboring sword had three times slain the appearance of the king. Three different people dressed in the guise of the king. And Douglas killed them all. Ganville his stomach and did grace the shame of those that turned their backs. And in his flight, stumbling in fear was took. The sum of all, that is, to shorten my story, the king of one hath sent out a speedy power to encounter you, my lord. In other words, you better fix your defenses under the conduct of young Lancaster in Westmoreland. This is the news at full. In other words, that's the way it is. Walter Cronkite used to lie. <laughs> so Northumberland says, I'll have time to mourn later. But now... 143, eh, 144. Weakened with grief, being now enraged with grief, are thrice themselves, hence therefore thou nice crutch, and he throws away his crutch. A scaly gauntlet, now with joints of steel, must glove this hand, and hence thou sickly coif, he takes off his nightcap. Thou art a guard too wanton for the head. What's he doing? Preparing himself for battle. All right. Now let, not, 153, Nature's hand, keep the wild flood confined. Let order die. What does he mean by order? Hierarchy? The chain of being? What's he saying? Let what rule? Chaos, man. Let's let loose the dogs of war. As is said in Black Death. Let order die and let this world no longer be a stage to feed contention and a lingering act. But let one spirit of the firstborn Cain reign in all bosoms. Well, what did Cain do? Killed his brother. Let fratricide, reign in all. He's not just saying, let's have a nice little civil war. No. Let's kill them all. Every single rat bastard one of them. That, each heart being set on bloody courses, the rude scene may end, and darkness be the barrier. Is he saying, and let my side be victorious? No. Let's all die. He's got no reason to live. Right? Bardolph, this strained passion doth you wrong, my lord. In other words, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not all die. <laughs> let, let's let the bad guys die. We're the good ones. It's Morton, sweet oral, divorce not wisdom from your honor. Divorce not wisdom. Where, where does wisdom sit in the human body? It's up here. He's speaking from what? Here. It's from sorrow. The lives of all your loving accomplices lean <clears throat> on your health. You know the old Bill Withers song, Lean on Me. Right. He's saying, All your friends do what? What's that word depend literally mean? D, from, pinned, like pendant, they hang from you. If you go down, they go down, slash we go down. All right? They all lean on your health, the which, if you give over to stormy passion, must perforce decay. So, 168, it was your pre-surmise that in the dole of blows your son might drop. Your pre-surmise. Now, there's a word we don't use today. Shakespeare makes all kinds of words up that nobody uses. That's one of them. What is a pre-surmise? Well, what does it mean to surmise? To speculate. So to pre-speculate? Because speculate, thank you for using that word, has what as its root? 
to see, okay? To pre-see is kind of to prophesy, to foretell. So he says, it was your kind of foretelling that said what? Your son's going to die if he goes to war. You knew he walked over perils on an edge, more likely to fall in than to get over. You knew Hotspur did what? Too big a bite. Okay. You were advised his flesh was capable of wounds and scars, and that his forward spirit would lift him where most trade of danger range. In other words, his forward spirit, his hot spur attitude, would put him where in the battles? Always in the heaviest part. He would never be the kind of general that did what? Sat back and said, no, Caleb, you go. <laughs> I'm going to sit back here and live. Okay. Yet you said, go forth. What's kind of the implication there? You didn't try to stop him. Could he have stopped Hotspur? Maybe. Probably not. Why? He was young and full of honor and glory. You know, move from this class to my class after this. He's like Beowulf. He lived to his high destiny. This is how Hotspur had to die. Hotspur, it would not be fitting for Hotspur to die at the hand of John Falstaff. Okay. And none of this, though strongly apprehended, could restrain the stiff born action. He says, what hath then befallen, or what hath this bold enterprise brought forth, more than that being which was like to be? The old English idea of weird. What will be, will be. Or the Renaissance notion, destiny. Destiny. It was destined to happen. Okay? So, Act 1, 2. So notice we get the conspirators, 1, 1. And then we get the, I don't know what you want to call Falstaff and his people. The false conspirators. The anti-conspirators. But... Anti, there, I'm not using it this way. I'm using it this way. Instead of. Okay? Because just as Hotspur and the other conspirators wanted to replace Hal, wanted to keep Hal from living to his destiny, Falstaff, and his friends want to also keep Hal from fulfilling his destiny. Okay? Um, so the Chief Justice comes in. Line, and I want to pick up 134. Yeah, 135. And the Chief Justice says, Well, the truth is, Sir John, you live in great infamy. Everybody knows you, and everybody thinks very, very little of you. You have a horrible reputation. False staff. He that buckles himself in my belt cannot live in less. In other words, because I am, because he's so big. Okay? Your means are very slender and your waist is great. Notice the pun. Your means, your income, and your waist, okay, W-A-S-T-E, your um, your liberality with money, okay, is very great, as well as his W-A-I-S-T is very great. I would it were otherwise. That is, I wish my means, my income was greater, and my waist slenderer. Notice, W-A-I-S-T. You have misled the youthful prince. The young prince hath misled me. I am the fellow with the great belly, and he my dog. 
Well, I'm loath to gall a new healed wound. Your day service at Shrewsbury hath a little gilded over your knight's exploit on Gad's Hill. What was that knight's exploit on Gad's Hill? The robbery. In other words, the Chief Justice. This is John Roberts saying, I've heard about, or this is kind of John Roberts, actually, and um, Christopher Ray rolled up into one. The head of the FBI and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Okay. Saying, yeah, I've heard about your little robbery and you're going to pay for that. But you did some worthy deed at the Battle of Shrewsbury. So we're going to kind of forget about that for now. In other words, you're kind of getting probation for that. You may thank the unquiet time for your quiet or posting that action. Okay. So, 162, they keep talking about the prince, and the chief justice says, you follow the young prince up and down like his ill angel. What's his ill angel? Yeah, Looney Tune cartoons, where you have the good angel sitting on this side, and the bad, evil demon sitting on this side, tempting whoever, in this case, how? Not so, my lord. Your ill angel is light, right? The devil can do what? Masquerade as an angel of light, the New Testament tells us. But I hope he that looks upon me will take me without weighing. What? He that takes me. Who's he talking about? God. Will take me without weighing. Thou hast been weighed and are found wanting. Old Testament, Nebuchadnezzar. Right? He's saying, no, 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 God, don't weigh me. Don't weigh my sins against my good deeds. Why? <laughs> Virtue is of so little regard in these coster mongers times. True valor is turned bearwood. Bearwood. Pregnancy is made a tapster, a beer maid, barmaid, and his quick wit wasted in giving reckonings. All the other gifts appurtenant to man, as the malice of this age shapes them, are not worth a gooseberry. You that are old, he's talking to the chief justice. Is the chief justice older than Falstaff? No. Same age. You that are old, consider not the capacities of us that are young. You do measure the heat of our livers with the bitterness of your galls. And we that are in the devour of our youth, I must confess our wags too. That is, we're in the hot days, the heady days of our youth, etc. So, Chief Justice. I'm going to skip a bunch. Pick up with um, the Chief Justice, 197. Well, God send the prince a better companion. Better than you. Falstaff says, God send the companion a better prince. God send me a better prince than hell. I cannot rid my hands of him. He, he won't leave me alone, he's saying. Well, the king has severed you and Prince Harry. In other words, well, you don't need to worry about that anymore. He's not going to be hanging around with you. I hear you're going with Lord John of Lancaster against the Archbishop and the Earl of Northumberland. In other words, you're going north. Where's Hal going? West. Okay. So, down a little bit more, 222, Falstaff says, um, will your lordship lend me a thousand pound to furnish me forth? Furnish me forth? Does that mean to get me a proper accoutrements, clothing? And stuff? No, it's to furnish me with troops. Why? Fodder for the cannons, you know. Chief Justice, not a penny. You are too impatient to bear crosses. Look at your gloss. One, afflictions. Two, silver coins stamped with the figure of the cross. Okay. Very well, commend me to my cousin Westmoreland. So, one, three. We see Hastings and Bardolph and... Let's see where to pick up. Um, I 
27. Now I back up. 20, um, 25. The Archbishop says, "'Tis very true, Lord Bardolph, for indeed it was young Hotspur's case at Shrewsbury. It was, my lord, who lined himself with hope. Okay, he's talking about Hotspur. Who lined himself with hope, eating the air on promise of supply, flattering himself with project of a power much smaller than the smallest of his thoughts. Okay. Hotspur flattered himself with the projection of a power that was smaller than the smallest of his thoughts. And so, with great imagination, proper to madmen, led his powers to death. And winking, leapt into destruction. Why? Because Hotspur wasn't afraid to die. Hotspur knew how to die. Okay? Hastings. Well, by your leave, it never did yet hurt to lay down likelihoods and forms of hope. So Bardolf says, talking about planning for rebellion, open war, and such. 41. When we mean to build, that is, when we plan to build something, what do you do? Well, we first survey the plot, then draw the model. And when we see the figure of the house, then must we rate the cost of the erection. Now, I think Shakespeare, at the time that he's writing this, I'm pretty sure this is going on about the same time, that this might be, I'd have to check the dates, about the same time as he is expanding his house in Stratford. He's bought a house and he's building onto it. So I think Shakespeare has construction details in his mind because he's kind of possibly acting as the contractor. Because, I mean, the language really fits. We do what? We survey the plot. We make sure the plot is proper. Then we draw the model. When we see what the house is going to look like, then you have to do what? How much is it going to cost to build all this? Which, if we find outweighs ability, if the house is too big for my pocketbook, then what? Well, then we draw a new model in fewer offices. We shrink the house down. Or at least desist to build it all. Or we wait until the bank account is larger. Much more in this great work. What great work? This building up of a new kingdom. <clears throat> this great work, which is almost to pluck a kingdom down and set another up. Okay. Where I grew up in, in California, when, when my folks bought their house, um, at that time in 1957, they spent $11,000 for a about a 900,000 square foot, 900 feet to 1,000 square feet house on a quarter acre lot, okay? When they sold that house in 1996, 97, 99, something like that, they sold it for close to 400,000. 900 square feet, one bathroom, okay? The people who bought the house came in with a bulldozer, <coughs> just trashed it, just tore it down. Why? Because they went and put about a 3,500, 4,000 square foot house where that house had been. So that you have, oh, you know, from like the house to the property line, less than the width of this room. Whereas before, we had, you know, like 40 feet on one side and 50 feet on the other side. Well, this house takes up most of that plot now. Okay? That's what he's talking about. Tearing down something to do what? build something even better. Should we survey the plot of situation and the model? In other words, Bardolph is saying, let's, let's pause for a moment and let's take the lay of the land. What's it look like? Are we going to be successful in this rebellion? Consent upon a sure foundation. Let's, let's determine a sure foundation. Let's ask surveyors, know our own estate, how able such a work to undergo to weigh against his opposite, that is the king's. Do we have the workmen slash soldiers to throw down this king and to erect a new one? Or else we fortify in 
paper and in figures using the names of men instead of men. Do we have Lord da 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 da, da on our side or do we merely think we have them? See, when Bolingbroke became king, what did he have? He had all the peers of the realm, except for a handful. They don't have all the peers of the realm on their side. So, like one that draws the model of the house beyond his power to build it, who, half through, what? Gives over and leaves his part created cost, a naked subject to the weeping clouds, and a waste for churlish winter's tyranny. We might get halfway there and then have to stop. Well, you, you know, that's where rebellion isn't like building a house. You can build a house halfway and stop. But rebellion, you can't go halfway. It's all or nothing. So, Hastings says, I think we are a body strong enough even as we are to equal with the king. Bardolf, is the king but five and twenty thousand? That is that all he has? Hastings, well, to us no more. That is, okay, yes, but to us it doesn't matter. For his divisions, as the times do brawl, are in three, three, three heads. That is, the king has more than 25,000, but guess what? His force is divided. Not divided against itself. Divided to fight different areas. One power against the French, one against Glendower, and a third against us. As long as we can keep those other two occupied, we can defeat the third that comes against us. Okay? Bardolph. Is it likely he's going to lead his forces hither? Well, yeah, Lancaster and more Westmoreland are. But the king and Harry Monmouth, they're going against the Welsh. We don't need to worry about them. All right. So what's Bardolph doing? He's kind of playing the role of Hotspur. He's egging on to war because he thinks we don't need to worry about the king's other two-thirds. Well, what if they get in the midst of battle and suddenly the king's other two-thirds show up? Then they've got a problem on their hands. Okay? Archbishop, let us, and we'll stop with this, let us on. That is, let's do it. And publish the occasion of our arms. Let's publish to the world why we are going in open rebellion against the king. What do you think is going to happen as a result of that publishing? Yes. We'll attract supporters. Okay? All right. Stop there. Have a good break.